Good evening, church, and welcome to you as we live stream today from our home, as you can see. Um, well, for those of you who are longing to be back in church, um, rest assured next Sunday we will be back at Scottskirk. Uh, so today is Communion Sunday, and as we uh, prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord's table, um, I want to speak to you about the cup of communion. But actually, I want to speak to you not just about what the cup symbolizes, I want to speak to you about what Jesus meant when he prayed, let this cup pass. So that's what we'll be meditating today as we prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord's table. So let's all pray and um, commit our hearts to God and at the same time uh, pray for God's anointing upon his word so that his word will speak to you no matter where you're watching from, no matter what your circumstance and situation is. God's Word has a message for you, and God's Word is powerful, and it, brings li it breathes life into those dead situations in your life. So let's pray. Father, we come before your throne of grace, and Lord, we want to thank you, Father, for uh, what you're going to do this evening, Lord, from uh, this place, Lord, into the homes of everyone who's watching. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit, even as Jesus, as you prayed for the centurion servant, Lord, he was miles away, but Lord, that prayer healed him miles away at that very instant. Lord, I pray that your word that is spoken today will be powerful and it will go forth and bring transformation, change, and, and Lord, a blessing into the homes of those who are watching, Lord, right now. Lord, anoint me to speak your word this evening, O oh Father. Holy Spirit, speak through me, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are going to talk about the cup. Now, the Passover Seder, the Jewish people partook of, consisted of four cups of wine that they drank. Now, uh, I've spoken about this to you before, but I want to med uh, focus on this today. The four cups of wine symbolize uh, four distinct promises that God gave to the children of Israel in Exodus 6, verse 6 to 7. Okay, it says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you from, out, from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So in this passage, we see four distinct promises. The first one is, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now that cup is called the cup of sanctification because it is bringing them, separating them from Egypt. Cup of sanctification, that's what sanctification means. Uh, the second promise is, I will rescue you from their bondage. Now that was a cup of deliverance or the cup of praise as the people are going to be delivered out of bondage, brought out of bondage, um, the, the, the response to that is praise. So it is also called the cup of praise. The third cup is, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Now this is the cup of redemption. And what we're going to see is that this cup is a cup that you and I partake of when we have communion. Uh, the fourth cup is, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Now that is a cup of restoration, also called a cup of acceptance. It is restoring them to be the people of God. So these are the four distinct promises and the four cups. And we're going to look at these four cups, and very specifically the third cup. Now the cup of sanctification says, I will bring you out. Out of what? Out of Egypt taking them, bringing them out of Egypt is sanctification. So God is saying to the children of Israel, I will bring you out of not just a land, but bring you out of a world. We are bringing you out of the world of Egypt. In other words, we are, I'm not just bringing you out from the burdens that have been put upon you in Egypt, but I'm bringing you out of the culture of Egypt. I'm bringing you out of the sins and sinful lifestyle of the Egyptians. And I'm going to put you in a place of freedom, but a place of a different culture, not just freedom. So that's why as soon as God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he took them to Mount Sinai. And what did he do there? He gave them the Ten Commandments. He gave them them the law and he gave them the, the, the system of sacrifice and the, and the ritual systems of worship and all these things God gave them out at Mount Sinai. What was God doing? He is saying, listen, I'm going to teach you a new way of living. 
Now, the laws are not just moral laws of uh, do not commit adultery, do not, um, you know, uh, cover, do not lie, not, not just that. There were religious laws, you know, keeping the Sabbath holy, not making idols. There were moral laws, but there are also civil laws, no, not to take eye for an eye, you know, to... to um, how to look after the slave and, and the servants and, and all these laws were there. In other words, God was saying, I want to bring you out of this, this sinful lifestyle and culture and form a new culture, a new way of living. In fact, he's, he, not only that, he said, I'm going to give you a new purpose for living. You know, their purpose as slaves was to serve Pharaoh. He said, from now on, you're going to serve me, you're going to serve Yahweh God. So they went from being slaves to priests, from serving Pharaoh to serving God. In fact, Exodus 19, 6, he says, And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is my message you must give to the people of Israel. Now, that's the same thing God does to us through the blood of Jesus. He brings us out of the sinful lifestyle and culture and brings us into a new kingdom. He takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of light. He takes us being slaves to sin and slaves to the culture to become, you know, a servant and priest, a royal priest to the holy nation uh, to, to uh, um, worship God and serve God. 1 Peter 2 9 says, but you are not like that for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest to the holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he calls called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. We are the called out ones, the sanctified ones. That's what it means. So he sanctifies us through his blood. That's what Jesus Christ did. In fact, the, 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 na the word for church used in, in Matthew, uh, when Jesus said on this uh, uh, rock I will build my church, the word there, church, it comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means called out once. And it's the same word Peter uses when he says, for he called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. It's the word ecclesia. And that's who we are, the called out ones, the sanctified ones. You and I have been called out. But sadly, many of us, even though we are called out, we still kind of go back into Egypt. We go back into, into, into bondage and darkness. We, we live with one foot there and one foot here. And, and the Lord is saying, as we partake of the cup, I want you to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's taken us out of darkness to live a different life. And that's why in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or it will be the other way around. In other words, he's saying, You can't live in that kingdom and this kingdom. You can't enjoy the, the, the things of darkness and think you can still have the blessings of light. You can't have that. And therefore, the, the communion table is all about bringing us out into the kingdom of light. Now Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. He says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be partners with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be part of, uh, partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Again, this come out from among them, among unbelievers, and separate yourself from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And, and then he goes on to say that. Now, what does that mean? What, what Paul is saying is, this is what God's invitation is. Don't borrow from the values, uh, the value systems. Don't uh, associate with their lifestyles. Don't uh, do business using their business uh, ethics. Don't associate with sinful lifestyle and culture. That's what he's saying. Okay, he says you are called to live a different lifestyle. You are called to value things differently. Sadly, the world values certain things, and he's saying, listen, you need to have different value systems. You need to have a biblical culture, a biblical value system. You need to have kingdom lifestyles. Now, does this mean that we can't have uh, unbelieving friends or people, uh, uh, people who are not Christians? Absolutely not. In fact, Jesus 
you know, he, he spoke to the, the Samaritan woman. He was, he, he ministered to the Roman centurion who was Gentile. The, uh, the, the woman, the Syrophoenician woman. He even, um, went, uh, and, uh, you know, with the, uh, the sinners and he had, uh, you know, the tax collectors and, the, and, and who, who, who else. But the difference was, Jesus didn't go there and was, he was not influenced by their lifestyle, their ethics and their culture. He went and changed their lifestyle, ethic and culture. He goes into Zacchaeus' house and just for a cup of tea and, and for some tea and, and by the end of the, I, whatever it was, whether it was tea or not, I'm not sure, but whatever he had at Zacchaeus' house, he spent a, a, a few moments with Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus was changed. What about the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well? He just goes there, spends a few moments with her, her life is transformed. This is what he did. See, when you live the sanctified life, you become a powerful source of light to a dark world. That's what happens. The problem is when Christians are not living the sanctified life, their lives, their light does not shine. Okay, their light does not shine and they are no influence. In fact, they become influenced and oppressed like Lot was. The Bible says righteous Lot was oppressed by the culture of Sodom because he moved into Sodom. He moved into their culture and soon he was oppressed. He lost his wife and he almost lost his life in that process. And friends, and this is what God is calling us out of. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 16, uh, Paul says, listen, if you're partaking of the Lord's table, you can't partake of the table of, of demons, he goes on to say. So, my dear brothers, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourself if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup of the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in his body? So, in other words, communion is about sanctification. See, we talk a lot about communion, we partake of it, but do we really understand what it means? It means to live the separated life. It means to live the sanctified life. Okay, we're going to the next cup. It's a cup of deliverance. He says, I will deliver you from Egyptian slavery. That's the, the, the second promise. And that's called the cup of deliverance. It's also called the cup of praise. I want you to understand E the Israelites were in Egypt for over 400 years. They were slaves there, especially the last half of their, of their um, journey or sojourn into Israel. Uh, to Egypt was one of the hardest because the pharaohs who came later began to oppress them. You know, they, they killed their children. They, they, they made them slaves. They just just ill-treated them and they were in bondage for so many years and it became so much so they began to cry out to God and when at that point God sends Moses the deliverer to come and give them the good news that God is ready to deliver them to bring them out and and the response to that was praise so sadly here were the Israelites they were they were toiling and sweating and even dying, spilling their sweat and blood to, to build a kingdom that was not theirs, that they will never enjoy. They were slaves. They were building monuments, houses, towers, whatever else for, for the Egyptians, and they still lived in mud huts. So they, all their toil was useless. And, and sadly today, there are many Christians living that life. They're building and slaving and striving and building kingdoms that have no eternal value, that they'll never be able to enjoy, never be able to take with them when they go to, uh, to heaven. In other words, they toil and slave for things that have no eternal value. Friends, don't be that person. God has called you to live a different life. He's called you to build a kingdom that is eternal. He's called you to partake in a kingdom that is eternal. And all that is possible because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the cup of deliverance. And, and when the Israelites heard the good news, they began to worship and praise God. And we see this in Exodus 4, 29 to 31. You know, Moses and Aaron returned and they, 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 they spoke about all that God had told them. And the Bible says, uh, and the people bowed down and worshiped God. Later we see when the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt and they crossed, came to the Red Sea and the Egyptian army came after them and almost overtook them. God delivered them through the Red Sea. And at the other bank of the Red Sea, the Israelites, once again, in Exodus 15, verse 1, they worshipped uh, God and they sang songs and they danced around in, uh, in, that, in that chapter. It shows that. So in other words, it's a cup of praise. It's a cup of deliverance. 
as Christians, we should never forget the good news. We should never forget the message of the cross of Jesus Christ or what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We should never forget the deliverance, a great deliverance that God has brought us out of. Um, and we should never forget to worship God and give thanks. So the communion table is also a table of giving thanks. It's remembering the blessings, the deliverance of God and giving thanks to God. That's what we do. Now Romans seven twenty four to 25 uh, the first part of 25, Paul is saying, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? In other words, he's saying, listen, I am a wretched person. I, have, I need deliverance. And then he remembers. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, I had no hope, but through Jesus I have hope. And now I live in that hope. And that's what communion does. The, the third cup is a cup of redemption. <clears throat> He says, I will redeem you with my power. This is the cup we drink at the Lord's Supper. Okay? The Lord's table, the cup is this cup of redemption. When God says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. That's what he tells Moses. That's the promise he gives Moses. He's, what he's saying is, I'm going to take you back. Redemption means to take you back or to buy you back. That's what redemption means, to buy you back. It's something that God owned. Um, you know, they gave themselves into slavery and now he's buying them back. The whole idea of redemption in the book of Exodus is God going, going and taking back what is rightfully his. You know, in Exodus 9 verse 1, when God sends Moses to Pharaoh, he says, let my people go. In other words, these slaves that you think you own, they belong to me. And God is saying, let my people go. So this third cup is a cup you drink usually in the Passover Seder. It's a cup that is drunk after supper. Okay, So <clears throat> when you look at the Passover of Jesus, the Passover meal that Jesus partook of, we see at least two cups and he speaks about a third. So Luke twenty-two seventeen, it says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Uh, the, the Luke 20, 2, 20. So three verses later, after he took the cup and divided it, three verses later, he says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And finally, in Matthew 26, 29, he says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the wine from now on until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So there are three cups mentioned at the Lord's Supper. The cup mentioned in verse 17 is probably the cup of deliverance and praise that we spoke about. Why would I say that? Because the Bible says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks. So he gave praise. He gave thanks to God. The, the second cup spoken about in verse 20 is a cup of redemption. Because he says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper. Okay, so this is the cup they take after supper. And he said, this cup is, uh, um, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the cup of redemption. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins according to riches of his grace. So his blood redeemed us. Okay, so this is the cup of redemption and the cup we partake of. We are redeemed by the blood. That's what the cup symbolizes. Okay, Hebrews 9.15 says, And for this reason, he is a mediator of a new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promises of eternal inheritance. Wow! He says there are promises and blessings because he has redeemed us from that lifestyle and that bondage and living in that darkness to a new covenant where there are blessings and, and all kinds of amazing things that God has for us. Now, this is so significant, friends, because what Jesus is saying is to his disciples, you know this cup as the cup of redemption. But this cup now is going to symbolize the new covenant to you. Okay, I will redeem you through my blood. Through his blood, he's going to buy us or purchase us. Okay, And this is so prophetic. This is so prophetic. Because if you look at the Bible, the first time the Passover was taken, 
uh, a lamb was given per house. So each house had to sacrifice a lamb. So the lamb was only for the household. And then they moved into the promised land, or, or, or when they were going in the Exodus, God instituted a second uh, festival called the Day of Atonement. And at the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice was for the whole nation, the sins of the whole nation. And now, Jesus says, this sacrifice that I'm making, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, will take away the sins of the world. It's not a household, it's not one nation, it's for the whole world. And that's why, friends, you and I can partake of the Lord's Supper. We can partake of it because of what Jesus did and the blood he shed on Calvary. And, and I tell you, if you were a disciple back then who was waiting for the new covenant, you know, when Jeremiah, we spoke about this last Sunday, about the Holy Spirit, and Jeremiah 31, 31 to 32, it says, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loved his wife, says the Lord. Now, he says, I'm going to make a new covenant. Now, the disciples knew about this. They were waiting for the day of that new covenant to come. In fact, in Jeremiah 32, God goes on to say something about this new covenant. And he says, 32, Jeremiah 32, verse 40, he says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. Wow! Think about that, friends. God says, I will never stop doing good to them. That's us. We are part of that new covenant. I will put a design in their hearts to worship me, and they will never leave me. Okay, the disciples were probably listening to all this, thinking back at those promises, and they were rejoicing. But as they were rejoicing, someone else was going to suffer, and that was Jesus. If he fast forward from that moment, he instituted the Lord's Supper and, the, and took that cup, to the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is agonizing. His life is being drained. His, his soul is being crushed. His sweat is like drops of blood. And he cries out to the Father. So loud probably, his sleeping disciples could hear him. Father, if you, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Okay, now, as some versions say, remove this cup of divine wrath from me. Which cup is this that Jesus is talking about? Friends, it's the same cup, the same cup that we've been talking. The cup of redemption to us was a cup of divine wrath to Jesus Christ. Remember last time we said the Holy Spirit, we talked about the Holy Spirit, and we said that for the Holy Spirit, the fire of God, for God's to baptize us with the fire of the Spirit, Jesus had to take upon Himself the fire of His wrath. Friends, in the same way, for you and I to partake of the cup of redemption that we are going to do in a little while, Jesus had to drink the cup of God's wrath. So the cup of redemption to us was a cup of wrath to Jesus. You say, how can redemption and judgment be the same cup? Because remember what God told Israel, uh, Israel, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. To one person it was redemption and to another it was judgment. And the mystery of judgment and salvation, wrath and redemption are brought together in this one cup. Jesus knew that the only way that God will bless us, the only way that He could redeem us, is if He drank of the cup of God's judgment. Yet He cried out, Not my will, Father, but yours be done. And friends, we don't know, but I kind of think the conversation would have gone on like this. The father would have said, drink my son. Because if you reject this cup, you will not see humanity saved. 
if you don't drink the cup of wrath there will be no redemption yes it will cause your soul to be crushed by the darkness of the cup yes it will cause you to feel filthy and wild and ugly so ugly and filthy like a child molester a murderer a adulterer a drug addict name the sin because it's all in that cup but drink it son because there will be no hope for mankind if you don't drink it there will be no hope for the adulterer there will be no hope for the murderer there will be no hope for the drug addict if you don't drink of the wrath of God therefore drink my son wow father let this cup pass this cup is not talking about a wooden cross friends it's not talking about nails that were driven into his hands and his feet no matter how painful they were he's not talking about the humiliation he would have to go through he's not even talking about the whipping and scourging he's talking about the wrath of god isaiah 51:7 god says wake up wake up o jerusalem you have drunk the cup of the lord's fury you have drunk the cup of terror tipping out its last drop that cold dark night in gethsemane these words i believe may have been spoken by the father to the son wake up wake up my son drink of the cup of my fury drink the cup tipping out its last drop drink my son the dregs of the cup of trembling and drain it out Jeremiah 25:15 this is what the lord the god of israel said to me take from my hand this cup fill to the brim with my anger and make all the nations who my sin you drink from it and god is saying my wrath is going to be poured out on all nations but the son says father If I am to stop that rot from tr- going to all nations I have to drink every last bit of it and that is why friends today we can drink the cup of redemption because Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath Should we not honor him Should we not go down on our knees and worship this savior Wow. That night was dark and evil, friends. Satan was at work. He got into the heart of Judas and caused him to 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 betray his master. He would bring fear into the hearts of the disciples and cause them to scatter and deny their savior. He would cause secret councils that would get together to falsely accuse the very son of God. Yet it was not all this evil that crushed the soul of Jesus. It was not all this that caused him to tremble in the garden. In fact, it was his own words. In Matthew 10:28, he says, "Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body." He's saying, "I'm not afraid of these people who want to kill my body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God." who can destroy both soul and body in hell and the son knew that friends that that night he was going to fall into the hands of an angry god that's why he trembled that's why he feared he was not afraid of the physical pain and suffering all he knew was the love of his father this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased The proverb said he was God's delight and he delighted in the father. But yet that night he would carry the weight of sin 
and become the very thing of hate and anger to the Father. He would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Preachers sometimes say that is God had to turn his face away from his son because he couldn't bear the sight of his son's torment and suffering. As a father who, who saw this, his child suffering and so much pain, he had to turn away. But that's not so. He turned away because he saw the sin. He saw his son soaking up every dreg of every sinful thought, every sinful behavior, every sinful act, every sinful thing that you and I and all the generations of people have ever done. And that's why the Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The word bruise means to crush. They crushed him, friends. Not the, cru the crucifixion, not the, not the beatings and the whippings and the nailing. It's the sin crushed him and the wrath of God's fury crushed him. He drank every last drop for you and for me. And then he says to the Father, it is finished. I drank it all. Look, Father. The cup is empty. There is no more wrath. No more sin. I drank it all. Friends, what saved us was not a wooden cross. It was not brass nails. What saved us was Jesus. Drinking the wrath of Almighty God that was thrust upon Him like a torrential tsunami. Picture this, you're standing at the coast and all of a sudden you see this mighty 50 foot tsunami coming at you and you know you have no hope. You can't run faster than that wave. You are finished. You're going to be wiped out of the face of the earth. Your memory is going to be no more. And you stand there thinking, God, what, I, what should I do? And all of a sudden, not even a drop hits you and you open your eyes and there is Jesus who has taken the full blow of the tsunami of God's wrath. Not even a drop of water touches you. That's why we can drink this cup of God's redemption. That's why the Father says, I will never stop doing good to them. Wow! I will never stop doing good to them is what God is saying to you and to me. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, this is the cup of blessing. Wow, that is communion, friends. Wow, we have so much to be thankful to God. The final cup is the cup of restoration or the cup of acceptance. God says, I will take you and make you my people. The final cup of the Passover said it was the cup of restoration. I believe in Matthew 26, 29 when Jesus said, But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this wine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus couldn't drink that cup that day because he had to die so that you and I could become the children of God. And he says, listen, I'm going to drink this cup anew. When I re this is a called the cup of restoration because it is about the restoration of God's people into the kingdom. And that will happen when Jesus comes and restores. The final restoration is in the millennial kingdom. But it was also called the cup of acceptance. And you know, when Jesus finished the Passover meal, he said something very wonderful to his disciples he in john 15 15 he says no longer do i call you slaves for slave does not know what his master is doing but i have called you friends friend the word their friends means covenant friendship you are mine now i have accepted you and that's what we drink with for those of you who will feel 
rejected for those of you who feel that God is far from you for those of you who Satan has got you deceived to think that God does not love you friends when you take the cup and the bread today and you partake of it understand Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to feel this way he died on the cross to tell you you are my sons and my daughters like the prodigal son he takes you and he puts his own cloak upon you his own righteousness is what the Bible says he puts his signet ring upon you the blessed Holy Spirit the seal of his covenant and he invites you to his meal to his table and says come and partake of this table that I have prepared for you in the presence of your enemies God says this to the Israelites he says I will take you as my people and I will be your God he is mine and I'm his Wow all that because he drank of the cup of God's fury let me ask you a question friends as I close is he worthy of it all are you like the man who found a treasure so worthy that you're willing to sell everything to purchase that treasure is he worthy of me putting him in the place of preeminence in my life the number one place does what he did for you make you want to hate the sin that wrenched and crushed his soul and to love him with all your heart that's the call of the table separate yourself from the sinful lifestyles the sinful culture of the world and join yourself to the one true love the one who truly loves you like no one else does you know there's a story said about uh, Moravian um, missionaries one was called David Nishman and the other one was called Johann Leo, Leohard Dauber these two men valued Jesus so much they understood that Jesus had made such a great sacrifice that they were willing to sacrifice their whole life for him so they wanted to take the gospel the power of the gospel to the Caribbean islands uh, St. Thomas where there were slaves and they had not heard the gospel because uh, the, the masters the slave masters didn't allow them any missionaries into that island to give the slaves the gospel so these two men thought we need to take the gospel to the slaves so you know what they did they sold themselves into slavery so that they could go there and and when they did that no one was willing to buy them because they were white men and no one wanted to buy white slaves so they didn't do that but nevertheless finally they convinced the people to take them as slaves to uh, to St. Thomas and as they boarded the ship and their family was there wondering what in the world has gone wrong with these people they've gone crazy they didn't realize that they were crazy in love with Jesus and they shouted and you know they were saying asking them why and then they shouted back from the ship to the family and friends who'd come to wave goodbye because they'll never see them again and this is what they say may the lamb that was slain receive the full reward of his suffering they lived their lives because they understood the suffering that the Lamb of God had gone through for them and they were willing to give it all for him friends does your life cry out that same cry may the Lamb of God receive the full reward of his suffering in my life in your life we are going to partake of communion friends so I'm going to give you about a minute to get ready and as you prepare we're going to come back and then we're going to have so we, you have about a minute so we're going to have a small break of a minute for you to get ready and then we'll be back to partake of communion <music>
come back we're going to partake of the lord's table as you heard he died he took the full wrath of god so that you and i can drink of this cup the cup of redemption the cup of restoration the cup of thanksgiving the cup of acceptance 1 Corinthians 11:23 to 20 um, 6 says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me you can partake of the bread now Okay. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, uh, supper saying This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne of grace. Lord, we want to thank you. Oh God, we want to thank you. for drinking of that cup that day lord 2000 years ago as you hung on the cross suspended between heaven and earth you drank every drop of god's wrath and therefore today the father would say to us i am going to bless you and i will never take my blessing away from you wow thank you jesus Thank you Jesus. Lord, I pray help us to live sanctified lives. Help us to walk out of the works of darkness. Help us to walk out of the things of darkness. And Lord, live the life that we could say, may the lamb of God receive the full reward of his suffering in every aspect of our lives. Oh God, receive the full reward. for why you die to purchase us redeem us back to yourself oh god receive the full reward and lord help us to receive the full blessing of the cross and right now i want to pray for those of you who are sick if you have any kind of sickness in your body remember jesus christ died for you and to deliver you from every curse of sickness to die for you and heal you of every sickness in your body that's why he drank of that cup sickness is not from god sickness is from the devil and therefore jesus died to break the works so he came to destroy the works of the devil he came to die to set you free from sickness and disease in your body all those things the pain some of you are suffering from joint pains there's a person who's watching you're suffering from joint pains in your in your fingers and your wrist and god is wanting to heal you right now in jesus name i pray that you will be healed there's a person who's suffering from back pain the lower back pain um uh, right down at the base of your spine you're having a pain that the pain is going down one of your legs and god wants to touch you and heal you right now there's a person who's watching right now you're hearing in in your in your right ear there's something wrong with your hearing and god wants to wants to heal you right now just receive by faith my friends Christ died to bring healing into your lives. Hallelujah. Those of you who have diabetes, heart problems, just place your hand upon your chest if you have a pain or a ache or any kind of sickness. Place your hand over it, over that and let let's pray and believe that God is going to touch you right now like the centurion uh, servant where Jesus prayed that moment and said your servant is healed. That moment he got healed. Yes, this is a live stream. You're not in a, in 
inside a service or a church but God can heal you where you are father I pray right now for my brothers and sisters who are watching Lord bring healing let the healing power of God invade their homes right now oh God bring healing into their homes as we partook of the covenant blessing the cup and the bread the covenant Lord I pray that you will uh, break every curse of sickness over their lives generational curses would be broken Sin uh, sickness would be broken cancer would be healed Lord diabetes heart problems arthritis would be healed in Jesus name kidney problems would be healed Lord I pray COVID-19 would be healed in Jesus name in Jesus name we pray father that you will do a miracle in the lives of these people in Jesus name I also believe right now there's someone who's watching um, you suffering from fear not one there are a couple of people watching right now you're anxious and fearful and God wants to banish that fear out of your heart and he wants to increase the faith in your heart and the trust that your God who took upon himself the wrath of the father is able able to protect you your God is able to see you through this difficult time you're going through and I pray that everything that is causing fear in your life will be banished from your soul in the name of Jesus and I pray for confidence I pray for love to invade the homes of the people right now in Jesus name I pray families are going to be blessed Lord in Jesus name husbands and wives are going to have a renewed love and passion for one another children oh God are going to see bless the blessing of God come into their homes in Jesus name father this is a covenant blessing the covenant promise because you took upon yourself the wrath of God so that right now those of us who partook of your covenant meal your sons and daughters have the pleasure of the father upon us what he said of his son this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased I want you to listen to this my brothers and sisters the father who said that to his son is saying that to you right now because there are some of you who are watching this and you are saying in your hearts God can't be pleased with me God does not love me that is a lie from Satan let me tell you what the Lord himself would say to you right now you are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased I love you and I gave my life for you for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son hallelujah God bless you church have an awesome awesome week knowing that he loves you he's there to protect you and he's there to guide you and lead you amen and amen God bless you